Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. James Delingford. Thank you so much for that introduction. My, now, my dad is at the back, and he said, whatever else you do, make sure you can be heard. So can everybody hear me? I love coming to talk to the Bruges Group, because unlike some places I could mention, e.g. the Oxford Union, <laughs> I'm guaranteed of a warm welcome. Just before I came, on well, just before I, I came up here, uh, a gentleman accosted me and said... Um, I expect you'd rather be hunting today, wouldn't you? And I said, do you know what? As I drove here, I drove past um, the Grafton who were unboxing. I, I, I did rather feel that I, I would like to be out with them, so sorry about that. Um, another lady came up to me and was talking to me about how she was a Quaker and the problems she had persuading the other brethren that actually climate change was not the biggest threat to our age. So it's really nice being with people who understand and get me and who are right but my lesson today, my sermon today, is just because you're right doesn't mean you're going to win. And I'm sorry to rain on your parade, but I think it's, it's, it's good that we're aware of the challenges that lie ahead of us. Let me begin by reading you a quote, which, with which I suspect some of you may agree. You may even recognise the author of this quote. I'll, I'll, I'll see if anyone can guess it. That such an unnecessary and irrational project as building a European superstate was ever embarked on will seem in future years to be perhaps the greatest folly of the modern era. And that Britain, with traditional strengths and global destiny, should ever have become part of it will appear a political error the first magnitude. Who said those wise words? Margaret. The blessed Margaret. And is there anyone here who disagrees with those wise words? Ladies and gentlemen, that is our problem. We all agree with that statement because we are all on the same page. And we're all on the same page because we are all right. And I don't mean right in the party political sense. I don't want to diss, for example, Kelvin. I don't know whether he's still here, but I recognise that there are people on the notional political left who are also of our, of our persuasion. Um, I mean people who understand the values that really matter. Um, I once wrote a book about this. It was called, funnily enough, How to Be Right. And one of the sad but true points I made in this excellent book, I have to say, um, is how much easier it is to be on the left than on the right. Because if you're on the left, if people know you're on the left, they automatically understand certain things about you. You are the kind of person who, seeing a blind person, helps them across the road. <laughs> if you're walking past the canal and you see a sack of puppies drowning in it, you instantly dive into the canal and rescue those drowning puppies. Um, it means you're sensitive. It means you understand literature, the arts. It means you have excellent taste in music. It means you're probably really good in bed. Uh, <laughs> we are not on the left. Uh, look at us. Look at us. Uh, um, everyone knows that people on our side of the argument are basically evil bastards. <laughs> which is why, which is why, why choosing to be on the right is choosing the hard path. It's a bit like, I wish I could remember the actual quote, uh, when Frodo goes on, on, on the mission to, uh, into Mordor to, to go and fetch the ring, and he grumbles to, to Gandalf about it. And Gandalf says, this is the deal, Frodo. I, 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 I. <laughs> he said, this is what we've got to do. And the reason we have chosen to be, among other things, uh, against the European tyranny, um, is that we have chosen the hard part. The good side about this is that we've thought very, very hard about our 
position. I think a lot of people on the left don't really think about why they're left. They just do it. They, it's like spray on niceness. They don't have to go any further than that. We are constantly being challenged for our, for our politics. We're constantly having to defend ourselves. And what this means is that we've, we've come to understand in our heads exactly why it is that we're on the right side morally and socio-politically. Uh, we understand the fundamental importance of things like liberty and sovereignty. We understand why, when Western civilization began at the, at the Battle of, of, uh, of Salamis, uh, why it was that democracy was born. It was because the, the Greek states appreciated that it is... I always get this wrong... <laughs> Um, better to die a free man than live a slave. We all understand that. Uh, we probably understand that the, the market allocates scarce resources more fairly and effectively than top-down command economies like the Soviet Union or the one that Jeremy Corbyn would uh, impose on us if he had half the chance. And it's for, th for these same reasons that we understand perfectly why we have to leave the EU. It's obvious, it's so obvious that I don't really need to explain it to you. We understand that the EU is sclerotic, undemocratic, wasteful, corrupt, inefficient, authoritarian, dishonest. In fact, worryingly like the Soviet Union. We're, we all know here we'd be so much better off out. It's an absolute no-brainer. And this, to return to my original theme, is our problem. The unfailing logic of our position can lull us into a false sense of complacency. Um, oh, I haven't, I haven't counted how um, time myself. Uh, 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 oh, oh, great. Okay, great. Okay, cool. Um, so, just because you're right doesn't mean you're going to win. Um, let me give you an example of this from my own rather unfortunate recent experience. As some of you will be aware, those, who, those of you who read The Spectator, I, I was in a debate at the Oxford Union last week. I thought Oxford. I was there. Great place. Sound. Um, and the motion was, uh, this house would break up media empires to save democracy. I thought to myself, well, this is a, a no-brainer. I mean, free speech is one of the one of the bedrocks of democracy, right? So, whatever you may think of, of Rupert Murdoch, the idea that, that people like um, Alan Partridge and uh, Hugh Grant and a few lef other lefty lovies and etc., the idea that they could break up their media empires is intrinsically, obviously, anti-democratic. So I was thinking, this is going to be a, a piece of piss, this. This one hands down. So, so I, 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 I sat there, complacently, perhaps arrogantly, listening to the speeches of the other side. And I was listening to Alan Rusbridger. Has, has anyone ever come across Alan Rusbridger? I, I mean, I, 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 I don't want to sound like sour grapes, but the, the guy used to edit The Guardian, right? Um, and he has that kind of smoothie chops uh, arrogance of the, of the liberal left establishment, that de en bar quality, that snobbery, apart from anything else. He doesn't want the masses to have access to page three tits or, or early editions of Game of Thrones or whatever. He, do, he, he, actually said, he actually said at one point, he said, you will hear from the other side that it is very difficult to break up media empires. I will tell you that it is very easy. All we have to do is to say to Rupert Murdoch tomorrow. You cannot have the sun. You cannot have the times. I, I, I paraphrase, but it was that effect. Um, and the audience, far from being appalled by the idea that somebody like Alan Rusbridger could just confiscate Rupert Murdoch's newspapers because he was on the wrong side of the argument, far from being appalled, they loved it. They, they lapped it up. And I realised then that I was on a very sticky wicked. <laughs> this is the problem that those of us in our wonderful, warm, cosy bubble of rightness 
uh, fail to understand. We hang about with people like us. We read the same newspapers. We, uh, our wives or husbands probably agree with us because otherwise if they didn't, it would be divorced, wouldn't it? <laughs> so we're used to having a kind of perpetual amen corner in our lives. But let me warn you, my lovely friends, my simpatico friends, the world is not like that. There are people out there, lots and lots of people, who do not understand why free speech is a good thing. There are people out there who don't even, who wouldn't even die for liberty. That is the very, very scary part. And I learned that bit of lesson. I got horribly pwned. Uh, I, I lost by something like 250 million to 77, something like that. Um, <laughs> And uh, well, I, got, I got a good story about it because I've now incorporated it into this speech and I've got a spectator column. But, but, but we do have a problem that there are people out there who are much more interested in virtue signalling than engaging with reality. That thing I mentioned earlier about why people choose the easy path of being on the left, it is all part of that, that virtue signalling. They don't care about the facts. They don't care about what will work versus what doesn't work. As long as they can hear a soothing, <coughs> progressive narrative, that is all they need to hear. They don't want to be right. They want to be nice. I've got a theory on this, by the way. Does anyone use Twitter? Probably not. But I've noticed uh, an almost infallible link between People who, whose Twitter avatar, avatars, i.e. the photograph they, they put of themselves on Twitter, anyone who posts a picture of themselves with their children is almost certainly a complete bastard. Uh, it's, people, it's just a fact. Um, these people are not interested in arguments. They like, they like slogans. And, and you'll find, that you've probably encountered this yourselves, they fight us with slogans. Little Englander, NIMBYs, extremists, fascists even. Farage! I, I mean, Nigel Farage, just a very brief word about, about Nigel Farage. If I had a, a penny for every time Nigel Farage is right about something, I'd be a billionaire by now. I mean, he was, he was right about, about the... Uh, about... ISIS terrorists coming in the, on the boats, wasn't he? He's right about, about, about so many things. Uh, although I, I do kind of agree that, with those who say that he's not the right person to be leading the, the out campaign, because he's great for people like us. We love him. But he's very much a Marmite character. And if we're to make any inroads into the other side, the people who are about feelings and stuff, Nigel's not your man because he speaks in, in, in truths and facts. They don't like truths and facts. I, I'll give you an example of this. Um, how many times have you read that statisticoid about how if we leave the EU, it will cost us billions in lost revenue and it will cost, what is it, is it three million jobs? Three million jobs? It's, it's obviously bollocks. I mean, there's, there's no way that if we import more from the EU than we um, export, yeah, uh, uh, this... It's obviously in their interest to keep trading with us. It, it, it just makes, makes sense. So how can they advance that as an argument? How can they lie in this way? It's because they don't care about facts. The truth doesn't matter that to them, and it never has. Let me give you a more topical and depressing example. The recent appalling events in Paris. Uh, now, I, I suspect that there are one or two of you here whose initial response, I mean, once you've got over the sheer horror of it all, was to think, if there is one good thing that will come out of this, this, these terrible events, it's that this will be the wake-up call that makes people realise uh, how iniquitous the arrangements uh, are under Schengen, for example. We, we, uh, my, my wife, who, by the way, I, 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 she's not here, but can you imagine... She hates the EU even more than I do. Can you, can you imagine? <laughs> in fact, she often berates me over breakfast for not being angry enough about the EU. And, and she, she, she keeps sort of talking of articles that I, that, that I should read to make me cross. And she says, look, look at this. This is so 
annoying. Have you seen that if you've got an EU passport, you can come out of Syria and you can get on, uh, you, you can enter uh, the EU at Greece and you can travel, uh, and they, they don't even look at your passport. Uh, only one in ten uh, people actually get their passports even glanced at. And, and then you can go all the way to, to, to Brussels and Paris and you can do terrible, terrible things. I totally agree with her, and I'm sure you all agree too, that Schengen ought to be a busted flush. But what do we hear with the bodies barely, barely cold? We hear these various EU commissioners saying, well, I'm sorry, but, but Schengen is, is here to stay. We might, we might uh, change the rules slightly for, for, for a month, but no more than a month. A month! This is going to last all our lifetimes and our children's lifetimes. This problem is not going to go away. I was talking to um, my, my, my honorary dad, my, my real dad's over there, my honorary dad is Christopher Booker. And um, uh, we, 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 I, I talked to, to, to the Booker almost as often as I talked to my father, and he was very bleak about all this. He said, you know, people like us think that this is going to be the wake-up call, but a lot of people out there are going to respond in the other way. They're going to think, well, if we leave the EU now... We're, we're, it'll deprive us of, of security. And what about, what about this very interesting talk that, 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 that they've been mentioning in the last couple of days about a new Euro intelligence agency? Maybe, maybe that will save us. Well, we all groan at stuff like this, but this is not how other people think. They don't want, they don't want facts. They don't, uh, it's like the kids at the Oxford Union. They have different values from us. Uh, these are the kind of people who even now are repeating phrases like nothing to do with Islam. Yeah. Uh, all those people... I don't even buy into this. I, I, I get disappointed when people like Ian Dale buy into this. I am going to call them Daesh because they shouldn't have Islamic... St it's just rubbish. It's just... It's just eyewash. It's denial, denial of, of, of what's really going on. Read Douglas Murray on this. God, he's good. He's so sound. Yeah... So, um, have I got time to mention the flies? Yes. They're interesting. Well, uh, <laughs> it was a thought that occurred to me. There's a marvellous book, um, a glossy book. Um, you know that, that book about the Flora Botanica, that big, thick, glossy book? There's another one on, on insects. Have any of you got it? About, I think it might be called Bugs Botanica. Um, I really recommend it. And there's a fascinating section on flies. I, and I bet none of you knew this. Did you know that up until about the, certainly mid-19th century, um, there were many, many f more flies in the, in, the, in the countryside than there are now. House flies and so on, all, all different varieties. And people used to think the flies were their friends. They used to think that I'm sure John Clare would, 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 in his poetry, would think flies are rather lovely, buzzy, buzzy creatures. You know, they're a bit like cows, but smaller. And they, they they land on the walls and stuff. You know, so you, so you're rolling your pastry or whatever in your kitchen or in your larder. The flies are everywhere, swarming over them. Oh, bless, bless. <laughs> it wasn't until the invention of the microscope, or rather the the widespread use of the microscope and the study of the bacteria, that people began to realise that these lovely, lovely, cute little little buzzy things were actually the enemy. And I sometimes think of us, people like us, as the people who've looked under the microscope and seen what flies can do, and they see the way they, when they land on your food, I mean, I hate, I hate this, but the way they, they vomit, and then they, they, they poo and stuff. You know, they're not nice flies, they're really not. Um, you, you die, <laughs> or get horrible diseases from flies. We're the people who've seen the flies under the microscope and what they can do. And the other people, the, our opposition, I suppose, are people who still look at flies and they think, oh, bless. I don't, I don't want to know about the nasty, the nasty microsoft stuff. Just look at them. They, they, <laughs> I'm gonna, anyway, I'm going to finish uh, with, a, uh, with a quote. Uh, see if you can recognise who said this. Um, because, uh, I, I think this person is right too. Is it almost as right as the first person. Um, there are only two coherent British attitudes to Europe. One is to participate fully and to endeavour to exercise as much influence and gain as much benefit as possible from the inside. 
The other, and it, this, the second part is quite surprising, if you know who this, this is saying it, the other is to recognise that Britain's history, national psychology and political culture may be such that we can never be other than a foot-dragging and constantly complaining member. Uh, very good. <laughs> Ruined it for everybody else now. And that it would be better and certainly would produce less friction to accept this and to move towards an orderly and, if possible, reasonably amicable withdrawal. Um, I don't care whether it's amicable or not, I just want withdrawal. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you're right, it was Roy Jenkin Jenkins who said that. Uh, and he was annoying in many ways, Roy, but I think, I think he, he got to the heart of the problem. And I fear that we are, that, that it is not written, even though it seems irrefutably logical that we should leave, leave the, the European Union, um, it, it is not a given that we will exit for, 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 for many of the reasons we've, we've heard from the other speakers today. I mean, Mary Ellen, I, I, I thought it was fantastic what you were saying, and fantastically depressing as well. I haven't heard this before. Um, I think there is a danger that, that, that in five years' time we'll still be there, a, a foot-dragging and constantly complaining member. So all I say to you is don't make the mistake that I made in the Oxford Union last week. Do not underestimate the enemy because they do not think as we do. And if we are to communicate the need to leave the European Union... We cannot just address ourselves. We also have to work out how to get into the weird mindset of the others. Thank you. <laughs>